Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. I did go to Utah State. I am a Sigma Chi fraternity member. Any Sigma Chi in the eye? Nice, and Hoke brothers. I have my two Gamma Kappa Pledge brothers right here, Brent Moore, uh, Brandon Pierce. Uh, we lived in the house. Uh, we had some fun times over there. And uh, we must have had too much fun because we all left after we went on missions. But uh, we had a great time here at Utah State. So first, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I think a lot about uh, sharing my experience in starting a company. And uh, I can remember back in just these quiet moments of total chaos, starting the company, having no resources, no money, just clutching me and, and uh, my two other founders, which are just remarkable individuals, together and thinking, gosh, this is hard. And then also thinking about the fear prior to starting the company being greater than the actual reality of starting the company. And I can remember thinking, I'm like, gosh, I wish I could just share this knowledge with my boys so that when they get to my age, they can have perspective that, yeah, it's going to be hard, but there's nothing to be scared about. And I mean, in the end, I, the worst thing that can really happen is you can be poor. And I imagine a lot of you guys are poor, starving students. So it can't get any worse than the poor, starving, starving student status that you're in today uh, and being an entrepreneur. So let me tell you a little bit mo about my story, if this clicker works. Yeah, let's do that. Great. So uh, I, I call this my journey. This is my experience. Um, this, these aren't like business um, facts. They're, uh, it's my experience with starting a company and how I went about doing it. The name of my company is Crossover Health, uh, and I call this my crossover journey. First of all, it starts with my family. This is my family, my wife, Rachel, my oldest son, Luke, uh, Reed and Ethan that are right here, my two ballers. Uh, and then Sam that's in the middle. Um, uh, Luke and, and Sam and Rachel are back home in Laguna Niguel. But this is, this is why I do it. I have so much fun with my family and uh, it's given us a lot of freedom, but uh, I really appreciate the support they've provided me over the years. So let me tell you about the company. Crossover Health, we're a primary care uh, medical group. We actually deliver uh, medical care to em uh, employees at these large campuses uh, Apple, Facebook, uh, Applied Materials, Comcast, Microsoft, etc. And our whole goal is to deliver awesome primary care so that we keep people healthy. Uh, we started in 2010, it's 2020, we had no revenue, you know, we're going to be over 100 million this year, nearly uh, 800 employees, and it's been just this incredible ride. Here's some of our partners. These are what some of our centers look like. This is actually in San Francisco. You can see this doesn't look like your regular doctor's office. Um, we do PT, Cairo, and Acu. It's all very private sessions, one-on-one -on -one with our providers. Again, the goal is to get people healthy. It's not to churn you out. If we can get you in there and get you healthy, then we can truncate those downstream healthcare costs uh, that are really expensive. Uh, this is right downtown San Francisco. Um, we spent a lot of time, as I was talking before, with some of the students uh, making it really nice. Um, and again, the goal with making it nice is to develop trust. Um, what we do is we invite you to change your diet, um, to exercise more. Asking somebody to do that is hard. And so in order to get to that level, we really have to establish trust uh, with our patients. And if you think about our business model, why somebody would do this, today in healthcare, uh, it, it looks kind of like this. Primary care is the smallest part of the healthcare industry. It, I, I really think about it as a speed bump. You kind of roll right over that speed bump of primary care onto uh, the specialist or the hospital or surgery. And the challenge is that you, you, those surgical things aren't going to fix the core problem. It all starts with lifestyle. And ultimately, sometimes you need that surgical event or you need that prescription. Um, but if we can actually have a bigger primary care program, what we've been able to demonstrate is that you need to use the hospitals and the specialists less. 
Uh, and that's a good thing because it brings the cost down. And so our whole goal is to expand primary care, um, make it very comprehensive, and reduce the need of people to go outside. And we call this the triple aim. It reduces cost, increases quality, and, and what makes it possible is an awesome experience. These are our results. So in an annual, in, in a year, we're going to see 350,000 um, people that come in physically for a visit. What's interesting on this is, is um, right here you can see uh, of all the people that we treated in a year, um, we'll do you know, 350,000 visits, but 600,000 messages, correspondence which is an indicator to us that people don't want to physically come in anymore. They want to talk to us online, right? I mean, your generation is all about, I mean, email is kind of antiquated, right? It's all about messaging. And so we actually see that in our data that healthcare can be delivered through messaging. You have a trusted relationship. And you can see that, you know, we, we do twice as many messages as we do actual visits. And what's critical for us is that we have a 93% uh, patient satisfaction, net promoter score 85, and 65% of the patients that actually walk in the door say, this is the place I want to come for healthcare. And that means a lot for us. So we're at this awesome point. Things are exploding at Crossover Health. And as, as somebody asked me at dinner tonight, like, do you guys ever face a pivot? And we absolutely do. And currently we're going through one because as some of you guys may have seen, you know, virtual medicine is becoming a big thing. And we think it's going to it's going to blow up. And what we actually anticipate is that our crossover center care here is actually gonna curtail off a bit and online care is just gonna to totally overtake it. But online care has been around for like a decade and the utilization of online care today is super low. And a lot of the experts say it's super low because people don't have a trusted relationship. You know, they don't wanna get online and then just have Google tell them about a doctor and go to that doctor and then talk to some doctor in their underwear on their couch petting their cat. They want to actually know who they're talking to and build a relationship. And so this is what we actually think healthcare will look like with this combination of virtual and physical. And just average people like me and all those talented people in our company who just can imagine a, a way that healthcare can be better designed this. And this actually exists now. And I am just totally privileged to be a part of it. Um, this, is, this is one of the, the fun pieces of, of being an entrepreneur, is that something doesn't exist, and then you can create it. Um, healthcare actually happens to be one of the areas where it's pretty easy. Um, I can, one of the things that gave me encouragement when I was first starting is there was a guy that I knew who was a, a rocket scientist, right? And he, he, was, he was working for Boeing, and his job was to put um, airplanes into orbit traveling Mach 7. His goal and his, his passion is to allow um, uh, commercial travel from like LA to Australia in like 15 minutes. So you could go to Australia for lunch and then come back. That is his vision. And of course, he's got to figure out a way to do that without blowing you up, right? And, and the process of that is really, really hard because he has to experiment with the shape of an aircraft in a wind tunnel that goes like Mach 1 for one second. And then he has to elaborate on the shapes of the aircraft and figure out how the compulsion is going to work um, to get you, get you there without blowing up. And I was like, that is a hard job. Mine's actually just kind of delivering healthcare. I think I got this one, right? So we created this, and we're super excited about it. And uh, you know, um, the one thing you don't get to see about uh, Crossover, you get to just see me. But there's literally hundreds of crazy, talented, passionate people that have made this whole company possible. Um, two of which are my, my partners and uh, co-founders, Scott Shreve and Rich Patrononi, who are my dear friends and just super talented people. And they are part of the great success of our company. So what I wanna do tonight is I wanna tell you what I've learned in this process, a couple of critical things. And if you work for me at Crossover Health, you know, you, you know two things that I expect out of you. Number one, if you come to me with a problem, 
my response is going to be, okay, just do the right thing. And then it's going to be kind of a puzzling moment, and I'm going to say, and use good judgment. And that's the advice that you get from me. And that's what I expect from people. And of course, you might be sitting in your seat right now thinking like, no, duh, dude. Like, it's pretty obvious, right? And sometimes doing the right thing is as simple as going through like a stoplight. And it's perfectly clear. You can see the red light. You can see when it's yellow or green. But sometimes it's just not like that. You know those stoplights when the sun hits it? And you're like, dude, if I run that red light, how am I going to explain to the cop that the sun was hitting that stoplight? And they won't know that I didn't really run it because I couldn't see it. Then life gets a little confusing, right? And that's what it's like to be an entrepreneur, is you have to reason. And I expect my people that work for me and that work crossover is that you have to use your brain. And it's totally OK to fail. In fact, I was telling uh, Dr. Glauser that, that when, when I love it when somebody fails for the first time. Because I see a, an employee that you know, was, was good all of a sudden fail and become really good for me because they have skin in the game. If they keep making that same mistake over and over again, well, then we got a different problem. we got to deal with that. But failure is great. And so part of this process that I keep thinking about being an entrepreneur is that it's, it's kind of like you know, being on a trail to a degree. Some people, sometimes in life, you're given a map. And that map tells you exactly where to go. And sometimes in life, you're just given a compass. And you have to navigate. I see that mountain, and I have got to get there. And some of you in this room will say, hey, look, I'm totally cool with the map, right? And some of you in this room may say, hey, I'm really cool. Just give me the compass, and I'll figure out how to get there, right? I, I can, with, with all of the unknowns, I am OK with that level of discomfort. And other people just want that map. And both people in, in our realities are needed. There's map people, and there's compass people. There's map moments. Sometimes I love to pick up a map. And then sometimes I'm just handed a compass and i got to figure out a really hard thing. But it's helpful to know these two landscapes. And I draw towards uh, map people. I read all about map people, or excuse me, compass people. So this is, um, I just finished the book Lewis and Clark. And I read all about their, their, um, their journey. And of course, you guys probably know about Lewis and Clark. Their, their mission from Thomas Jefferson was to go pave a way from east to west, right? And basically, there was you know, a big land grab um, as North America was coming about. And they didn't want uh, England or Spain or other countries, French, to come claim big chunks of, of North America. And so they wanted um, Lewis and Clark to go chart this path forward. And the western frontier was like St. Louis at that time, right? Think about that. It's, it's mind-boggling when you're reading the book. Like, the West, it's like St. Louis, right? There's a lot more West. And these guys had to pack up a crew, right, and go navigate some Native American trails where, again, relations with Native Americans what, wasn't that good because most of the time we were trying to kill people or, um, uh, you know, kill their, their animals or you know, do bad things. And so they're walking through there trying to make it east to west with no trail, not knowing what it looks like. There's no map and, and trying to make this happen. And it's really exciting to see just the bravery and the courage of Lewis and Clark as they went forth to do this. And of course, you see some of these lines and they're like circular. That's like when they screwed up, right? And they lost all their gear. And how they made it, I have no idea. But they had a ton of courage. And they just held on to that compass. Um, and they were successful. And I really respect them. And um, um, I learn a lot from them. Um, I, I also think about, this is my partner, Scott Shreve. Um, I love Scott. Uh, he's, he's like a big brother to me. I look up to him. Um, he's given me a lot of opportunities. And uh, just a, a really talented guy. And sometimes I look at our, this is the website, uh, our website. And I look at this, and I think, um, there's Scott. People are like, oh, man, Scott, he's so fortunate. Doctor, you know, he's like this great athlete, great family. You know, gosh, life's good for Scott. How come he, how come he got to be the CEO 
of crossover health. And you could go to any CEO of any big company and, and maybe it'd be easy to, to say that about Scott. But let me tell you about Scott's life, okay? This is Scott's career. So first of all, Scott went to, to medical school at the University of Utah and then residency. And Scott's awesome wife, Michelle Shreve, she's just like super talented woman, went to college, worked manager retail, and just worked her tail off to put Scott through school. And like the outcome's like, dude, I, I married a doctor, I'm putting through school, maybe there's some light at the end of the tunnel, right? So as soon as he gets out of med school, he launches a company called Medsphere, okay? Okay, so he's kind of working in the ER, but not really, not getting paid at Medsphere, so they're like totally living like the, the student poor salary, like she's like, well, when's this gonna end? Like I already did like the residency years and all that. Um, so he launched Medsphere, get going a little bit, start to have some su success, boom. Sued by the investors, $50 million. So Michelle's like, dude, this is not the path that I expected to take. So right at the moment they're having some, some success, sued by the investor, they win the lawsuit, lose the company. This is Scott's life. Scott has so much courage. He's, he's, he's afraid of no one. And just coming out of that is the time he's like, I'm gonna start another great company. And Michelle's like, you're nuts. And you know, it's so funny to hear her perspective because he is totally nuts. I don't even know how she put up with him, but they're such a great partner, partnership. But he started a great company. And today what people see is they see this, but no one sees this, right? No one sees the ton of failures that Scott and Michelle and, and the hard things that, that they had to go through, right? They probably just see the end. Man, we have failed so many times. And those failures are the things that have made us successful, especially Scott, okay? In my own case, um, I wrote this journal entry. Again, remember, I was trying to think about, gosh, there's gotta be some good of all this pain. And I just gotta tell my boys someday, two of them are here, that it's gonna be okay. So when we were just starting the company, I wrote this in my journal, August 7th, 2010. Since late January, I've been working with Scott Shreve on a company called Crossover Health. The company is a membership-based medical practice. It is, in fact, very needed in healthcare today. Rach, my wife, and I are both excited about the new company, but startup, I've been putting a lot of hours into Crossover I'm still working at. My other company, my other employer was gracious enough to let me work there. Um, because both companies require significant time, something has to give. That's usually Rach and my oldest son, Luke. Rach has been pretty supportive and understanding. She likes the company, but it does cause stresses, especially financially. Yeah, because we're broke and we're not getting paid. That sucks, right? Um, we invested a small amount in, uh, uh, of money in crossover, but the amount was most of our savings. We're looking to raise about a million bucks in the first round. So far, angel, angel investors have contributed 300 grand. We're trying to get a loan for another 300, but the loan has been delayed multiple times. This has caused us to slow construction in our clinic. We're in a situation that I've had to ask my dad for about 20 grand. To be honest, we absolutely need a miracle. I can't tell you how many times, if you search miracle in my journal, it's like a thousand times, okay? Um, we need a miracle to happen. We have a meeting tomorrow night that will, uh, that will help us decide whether we can secure a small business loan. SBA, man, those loans, they're like you're trying to pry them out of somebody's clenched fist. So hard to get. Um, if we don't get the loan, then we have to look other places for money. It's super stressful. We didn't get the loan. Somehow we survived. Miracle after miracle, tons of hard work. This is what it was like to start the company. Um, we, we're not, I don't know that we're unusual people or, or remarkable people, but we're just going through hard moments, and it's that grit that carried us through. And uh, Ray Dalio wrote a book called Principles um, recently. It's a really good book. But the one thing I remember from it was the pain, the hard things, plus reflecting on those hard things equals progress. And I've absolutely observed that in my life. If you experience hard things and you don't learn from it, then man, that sucks to learn that lesson again. But if you reflect on that, those hard things literally become treasures. And I don't need to tell you this as an entrepreneur, I'm certain that you guys have learned this in one way or another in your lives, but it absolutely applies to business. 
So let me tell you the observations that I've had um, through this process um, that I try to live by. There's three things. There's lots of things. These are my three things. You guys, as you start your companies and as you experience life, will come up with other things. But these things matter to me, and maybe they'll help you. Number one, no ego. That doesn't mean that every successful company doesn't have an egotistical leader. Certainly, there's people that are egotistical that are totally successful, okay? And people that aren't egotistical and totally successful. But I'll talk about what I mean by no ego. Don't go it alone. I'll tell you from my perspective what has been tremendously helpful. And then the last thing is be fearless, not reckless. I think there's a difference. And you've got to figure out how to balance that. First, no ego. One of, the real, one of the goals that I realized in humbling experiences was the real goal here is to do right, not necessarily be right, okay? Like, I am starting a company. I want this company to be successful. Whether it is my idea in a particular thing or not, that it's the right idea, I shouldn't really care. But somehow our emotions, somehow our pride, somehow our egos get in the way and we we distort the fact that, no, it has to be my idea and the right idea, right? No, it should just be the right idea. And let me explain. So who in here knows the scientific method? All right, right here. What is the scientific method? Exactly. Okay, and in the, in the, when you develop a hypothesis, it's usually like that something will work or won't work, right? And in the results, if you said it will work, do you get a bad grade in the results that if it didn't work? So if you said A was supposed to work, but in the results you observed B working, in, in your experiment, is that a bad outcome? It's a learning. It shouldn't be, right? You just learned that A does not work. You have proved that B works. That is a great outcome, right? And that's how it is in business, right? You really shouldn't care if it's A or B in the scientific method. All you care is that you know it's A or B, right? The same thing I have observed in business. And the same thing I always have to remind myself when I go into meetings and we're, we're fighting over a passionate topic is that, Nate, remember, I, although I think it's A, I shouldn't care if it's B. I care that we know what the right answer is. And I always have to check myself and, and, and check my ego and, and remind people in the room, it's like, hey guys, we're fighting for the right thing. Let's viciously debate the right answer here. But let's remember, it's not somebody's idea, it's A or B is what we're looking for. And that's what I mean by no ego. Um, don't go it alone. Uh, I love Abraham Lincoln. Uh, gosh, I wish we had politicians today like Abraham Lincoln. Super humble guy, right? And, uh, of course, he fought for the Emancipation Proclamation, Proclamation the 13th Amendment, freeing slaves, um, the Civil War. Uh, one of the fascinating things I thought just about that time is you, you, I always imagine that people were either, you know, for the Confederate Army or, or, or pro-slavery or against slavery, but they really weren't. It was a really confusing time. Some people were probably that black and white, but... but um, um, general Lee, Robert E. Lee, he was the Confederate general and some the poster child for you know, the slavery movement. But he actually, Abraham Lincoln went to him first to be the general for the Union Army and invited him. And he couldn't do it because his family lived in the South. Um, and that was a really hard decision. He didn't believe in slavery outright, um, but he just couldn't fight against um, uh, his family. And that was the, was the trouble he was in. Um, Really difficult times back then. But Abraham Lincoln, I'm a big fan of him. And Abraham Lincoln, what he did, what was so remarkable about Abraham Lincoln is that when he ran for, for, uh, to be the president, um, those political rivals that he ran against, right, those divisive people that were fighting and arguing, he brought those people into his cabinet. It's like Trump today bringing in uh, Bernie Sanders and Michael Bloomberg and... Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Imagine that being Trump's cabinet. It would totally fail, I think, or vice versa, right? Um, but that's exactly what Abraham Lincoln did. And why did he do that? At, the, at, at his uh, funeral after he passed away, um, um, this quote from the book, Team of Rivals, it says, uh, talking about his cabinet, 
the remarkable group of rivals whom Lincoln had brought into his official family, they had fiercely opposed one another and often contested their chief on important questions. But as Seward, William Seward, who was the Secretary of State, later remarked, a cabinet which should agree at once on every such question would be no better or safer than one counselor. If the cabinet all thinks the same, it's basically like one, one voice. How valuable is that when you're trying to get to the right answer? And Lincoln had afforded them an opportunity to exercise their talents, their independent thoughts, right, to the fullest and to share in the labor and glory of the struggle. This is absolutely a critical success factor in our history. Scott, Rich, and I, the, there's fighting in the company today, and that fighting is with the spirit of finding the best solution. You saw that beautiful video? That beautiful video just didn't like birth out in, in like some beautiful moment. We fought really hard about making that come to life the way that it was. Lots of different ideas. Another thing that I love, um, I again read a lot, Boys in the Boat, fabulous book about the 1936 gold medal winning crew team from the University of Washington. And the idea of teams coming together and what they can do in partnership, I love this quote, the team effort, the perfectly synchronized flow of muscle, oars, boat, and water, the single whole unified and beautiful symphony that a crew in motion becomes is all that matters. Not the individual, not the self. Even as rowers must subsume their often fierce sense of independence and self-reliance, at the same time they must hold true to their individuality, their unique capabilities or oarsmen, or as women, or for that matter, a human, uh, as human beings. It's really critical that teams allow for that um, personal identity of individuals to come forth. But great teams, when they're really charging, you can do both. And it's this, you've probably been on teams before. I've certainly seen it cross over in other teams where you just can finish each other's sentences, finish plays together. And it's really exciting. And going it alone is really hard. There's moments when you need counsel, when you need support. And um, having good partners and having a good company and building a great culture um, affords you that great uh, team environment to go out and be successful. This is some of my team. Scott is uh, up there. Scott's wife, Michelle, is across the table. Uh, Rich Patrononi is next to my wife, Rachel, and then Jocelyn Juan is his wife. We've been at this since 2010 together, locked in it. Total family commitment. It's awesome. Last thing, be fearless, not reckless. One of our mottos at Crossover Health is actually to be fearless. And let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. Uh, I'm not going to use a client name, but um, client number one. One of the fascinating things, we, we, we were early on, a couple of clients um, under our belt. And uh, we're brave people. I think a, a lot of uh, our success is because people picked us because we're independent thinkers. And I just remember there's always a, a, um, a crowd of voices around employers uh, and advising them, right? And uh, it's really a safe place to be the yes man, right? You're not drawing attention yourself, you know, no one's gonna, you know, call you out if you're just saying being the yes man. And for us, that's a dangerous place to be because we never wanna give our clients bad advice. I never wanna give anybody bad advice. I wanna give them the truth and they can decide what to do with the truth. And I remember there was a really hard moment for us and the client was heading down a path with advisors making a hard decision, and we absolutely disagreed with it. And we're rookies, I mean, we got, I mean, who are we, right? We've been around for a couple of years, and it was part of our principles to be fearless and share our opinion. And it was a dissenting opinion, it wasn't what the client wanted to do, but we had to voice what we believed was right. And it was really important for us, of all things, the client gets to pick, for that client to know just like with Abraham Lincoln, that what they were gonna get from us and our partnership was honesty and truth. And they could count on us for that. That they weren't gonna get a yes man. They weren't gonna get a cabinet of one, right? They were gonna get somebody that, that was gonna put critical thought into this. And we've always believed that that was important. And we've had to be fearless. And we've taught this principle over and over again in our company. 
And I encourage you guys to do the same, is don't be the yes man. If you feel convicted about something, if you have a deep belief, share that belief. And let them know why you believe that. And um, I think that you'll find a lot of value in speaking that honesty. The second thing was, is actually an example of this, where we had this dissenting opinion with a, a different client. And I asked, it was a really hard situation, potentially losing the client over our position versus um, um, uh, what the client wanted to do. And so um, I had a brand new account manager working on this, and she was totally capable. She's this awesome Apache helicopter pilot, done two tours in uh, uh, the Middle East. Um, just tough as nails, I'm way tougher than me. Mom just uh, went to the Naval Academy and then went out and got in the Army because she wanted to fly Apache helicopters. Really talented woman. And then I threw her in this business environment and said, hey, it's a big one, let's not lose this account. And I really challenged her to think hard. Um, and she did a fabulous job. And this is what she wrote. And what's important about this quote is you can kind of see her work through her thoughts. And again, remember, my advice to everybody is do the right thing. Well, what's the right thing? I don't know the right answer. I don't know that I have it. You've got to figure out what it is. You've got to use good judgment. And I'm certain that uh, those moments of uh, being an Apache helicopter pilot in combat, right, um, she's probably had to deal with some hairy situations and use some, some good judgment to figure things out. And, uh, and that's what she did here. So um, she made the comment that uh, one of the examples that I asked her about that comes to mind is the shift from 30 and 60 minute visits to 20 and 40. We were talking about that at dinner tonight. Does anybody ever force you to go to fewer visits or, or lower visit times? Well, one client was asking us to. And we're like, no, don't pervert the model. And so um, this was such a great struggle as she was battling on this topic. At the outside, it felt like there was a clear dividing line of what was right and what was wrong. It took a lot of work for me to gather my perspectives and see things through several lenses. From each perspective, there was a different right and wrong way forward. I had my own feelings about the decision. I did voice those. That was part of doing the right thing for me. In the end, we ended up making it the shift, and ultimately, I think it was the right thing in the moment for the client, which in turn was the right thing for a crossover. Scott, uh, my partner, and I, have talked about this decision since. We both agreed that although it did not seem to be in line with our model of care, one of our values is design everything. We designed and implemented something specialized for a client that regardless of outcome was ultimately in keeping with our values. It has some implications that we're still considering now, but it was the right decision at the time. As I reflect on that, my point is that doing the right thing means making a decision with all the available information that is best aligned with our values. She absolutely nailed it, you know? Again, these right decisions, they're, they're like onions, right? You keep peeling back layers. It's never like that stoplight. And I'm just opening, hopefully you guys realize this and opening your eyes to this as you go out and start companies that these are complex issues. But as you have grip, grit and you step into this, then, and you think hard and use the best judgment that you have, especially the judgment acquired through failures in your life, you're gonna to get to the right answer. So I wanna conclude by just emphasizing that you've got to enjoy the journey. I can remember countless times in some of, some of the most critical moments along this path. I remember laying in bed with my wife and just kind of leaning over to her and just saying, I cannot believe how lucky we are. We're like running out of money the next day, you know, whatever crisis is happening, I just felt so fortunate. And it's made me reflect a lot about the reward in the journey. And I want to share my perspective that oftentimes people fascinate or, or kind of speculate that you're, you're working so hard and there's this plateau of reward at some point in the future. And that reward is going to bring this watershed moment of happiness, maybe financial gain, whatever the case may be. And so far, that just hasn't happened for me. The reward in this journey has been every moment, every white knuckle moment, 
every hard decision, every near miss fatality that we had, um, every time we reflected upon the journey has been just the richest reward for me. I mean, I could walk away from Crossover today with no financial exit, and I would be so happy, so fulfilled. And so as you guys go out and start your companies, don't lose sight of the journey and the reward that the journey brings. And then there's not just some destination that all of a sudden this pot of gold of happiness appears and then you're happy. That's just not how it works. Happiness can be acquired at every step in the journey. And I encourage you that you work hard to find that happiness along the journey. Um, Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, right, said it way better than me. And this is possibly one of my favorite quotes um, from a founder. He said, you know, here he is at the end of his journey. He's had the pot, a huge pot of gold, right? And this is how he feels about it. He says, it seems wrong to call it business. It seems wrong to throw all of those hectic days and sleepless nights, all those magnificent triumphs and desperate struggles under that bland, generic banner, business. What we were doing felt like so much more. Each new day brought 50 new problems, 50 tough decisions that needed to be made right now, and we were always acutely aware that one rash move, one wrong decision could be the end. The margin of error was forever getting narrower, while the stakes were forever creeping higher, and none of us wavered in the belief that the stakes didn't mean money. We wanted, as all great businesses do, to create, to contribute, and we dared to say aloud. When you make something, when you improve something, when you deliver something, when you add some new thing or service to the lives of strangers, making them happier, healthier, safer, or better, and when you do it all crisply and efficiently, smartly, the way everything should be done, but so seldom is, you're participating more fully in the whole grand human drama. More than simply alive, you're helping others to live more fully. And if that's business, all right, call me a businessman. Maybe it'll grow on me. I love this quote. Awesome book. It's called Shoe Dog. You should absolutely read it. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight. We'll take a couple of questions, um, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Rue's going to run around with the microphone, so just raise your hand and Rue will come, come find you. My question is, how did you meet your partners and how did you know you'd work well with them? Uh, you know, uh, that's a great question. I had this question at dinner. So, uh, one of my partners uh, is Mormon, and he lives in my area in Orange County. We met in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we were at a booth, and I didn't even know him, and um, it just so happened to be we were both like trying to do something, and we shook each other's hand, and it turned out that he went to BYU, I went to BYU, he lived in Orange County, I lived in Orange County, we went to the same church, we didn't even see each other, um, and we just started surfing for a couple of years. We built a friendship. And, um, uh, and then the other partner, right as we started the company, he came in. And Stephen Covey talks about the speed of trust, uh, and it just happened. It was magical for us. We both worked hard. Uh, we all, none of us had a lot of greed. I mean, we're 10 years into this thing, and, and greed is just not in our DNA. And not that that you know, makes or breaks a company, but um, you know, for us, we were so passionate about changing healthcare. Uh, and then we just started working hard, and um, it just worked. It, there was never a doubt. We just worked, uh, and we feel that's probably the luckiest thing that we experienced uh, along the way is just our partnership, because uh, it doesn't always happen like that. So, um, I have a question about the books that you mentioned at the beginning of the PowerPoint. You know what? Um, I will. I read an insane amount. And they're awesome books. And I will share, um, uh, my dad says reading, I, I audible. I run a lot, so I just listen to it on audible. Same thing, you get the same stuff. Um, I'll email it to my, my, my book list to my dad. Um, 
and uh, he can share it with you. I just finished Winston Churchill. That dude is awesome. Great book. So, yeah. For the um, broadcast, yeah. So you primarily partner with large companies to provide health care to their employees. Do you plan on opening clinics that would be available to the general public eventually, or is that pretty far down the road? We absolutely do. It's just hard. I mean, the, the, the health insurance, we have a different payment model. The health in, the healthcare space is dominated by a fee-for-service business model, which we actually believe is, is not conducive to to changing the system, right? It pays doctors to do more things. So whenever you come in here, I just want to do more things to you rather than, than just keep you healthy, right? And so um, we work with these large employers because they are the insurance company. Once you get over about 1,000 employees, then, then you become self-funded or self-insured. And so they pay us directly. They don't pay us fee-for-service. Um, so we are trying desperately to find ways to step outside of the large self-funded employers, continue to serve them, to make it more available to the general public. It's, it's really needed in the United States, so. What were some small things that you might have done in college that led to successes later down, like now? Yeah, I, I had a great question uh, from, I, I spoke at the, my dad's uh, honors class, and, and one of the questions that kind of came was like, okay, well how, like I'm 22, like how do I, I started the company when I was 32, I'm 43 now, like, how do you get there? Like, how did it all happen? Well, it happens slowly, and then it happens suddenly. And the way it happens suddenly is that you're in a position to be prepared. And I would just encourage you, the things that I did is I was just ravenous about understanding why, why things worked. Um, you know, you guys are going to be in some really boring jobs coming out of college, OK? Um, unfortunately, you start at the bottom rung, OK? But you guys can move up that wrong, and you guys can become really interesting by making the boring exciting, okay? By going the extra mile. And frankly, you can't do much else, right? You're not gonna save the company. You're not gonna throw a Hail Mary, most likely, to, to, to get the touchdown for the company. But man, you can learn a ton. And I think the thing that I, I did at a young age is I just learned a ton about healthcare. I think I know a crap ton about healthcare. And it's because I learned a long time ago. And, um, and I just threw myself at it. And so you got to become valuable, uh, a really sharp tool. And the way you do that is you just work really hard and you throw yourself at the mundane. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Work really, really hard. And learn from your mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to, not making mistakes is not the pathway to success. Make those mistakes. Don't make them too many times, the same one. That's the pathway to failure. But make those mistakes. And don't be afraid of making those mistakes. That's the pathway, pathway to success. So. Um, so I'm sure you've heard the statement that the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. So what would you say made it possible for you guys to succeed in your partnership with you and your two partners? I mean, it's, it's just been trust. It's just what it is. I mean, and, and I, I, um, I, bring up the, the, I bring up the greed thing because oftentimes the things that breaks up partnership is money, right? And I just feel like we have been protected from that spirit of greed. Um, that may not be the case of every partnership. Again, I'm talking of like an N of one. I'm an expert on crossover health. That's it, nothing else. Um, and so our, our partnership was a ton of trust and, and lack of greed. Both Scott and Rich are not greedy people. And I don't think I am either. And we all just set the bar. It wasn't like, hey, let's not be greedy to ruin our partnership. It's just like we never operated that way. It wasn't ever about money. So I think that's the thing. Trust and lack of greed um, protected our partnership. There's a little bit of luck in there, too. Probably have time for two more questions, so get in while you can. We've got our Euro student right here. I've got a lot of questions from Holland. 
Um, so I was wondering, during your presentation, uh, you basically mentioned two values, trust and prevention. And since you refer to the values a lot in your presentation, I was wondering, what are the other values of your company? Oh, and did you <laughs> Did you determine these like before you set up the company, or did they develop later on? Um, this is being videotaped, and my, my partners will probably watch it someday. I'm, my HR officer will probably wa watch it, and I'll be like a terrible steward of not knowing our values. <laughs> um, we developed our, our values early on, um, and uh, I can't even say I'm there's like four or five, be fearless, resonated with me. But um, trust, one of the things that we did in our company just because we are serving our patients is like, um, you have to design a, a great patient experience. If your product sucks, you, got a, you don't have a marketing problem, you got a product problem. People, your, your product needs to really be great. And what we knew is that if we were gonna, healthcare's not, like who wants to go to the doctor's office? No one. Right, that's not an exciting thing. We had to make the experience so awesome that people felt comfortable going to the doctor's office, that they wouldn't kick the can down the road. And so one of the things we designed, one of our, one of our values is design everything. Um, so we designed a great experience so that we would build trust with our patients and people would come back. We don't do a ton of marketing. Uh, our name isn't a well, it's not like a household name. Um, and uh, part of that is because it's word of mouth. Um, we're not out, you know, blasting the web um, with our marketing. Um, but um, so, so one of the things we spend a lot of time is the patient experience. If you're thinking about designing a company, your product has to be awesome. Don't blame marketing because your product's not selling. It's got to be a great product that people just want it all the time. So. Okay. Thank you.